So um, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Kellen Damon. I work with uh, a community development agency for the County Marin on the sustainability team. I'm joined uh, by Julie Chu, who's our media tech for the sustainability team and Russ King, who's gonna be your presenter today. And this is the first uh, webinar in our series this November that we're doing mostly on electrification projects. Um, just because they are, there's a lot of funding coming down the road for them, and a lot of folks that we've seen uh, call into our office with questions and you know apply for building permits. It's really a popular popular thing right now, a uh, project for homeowners to do. So we just wanted to have these webinars so people could get their questions answered and, and learn more about the technology and uh, programs that can help um, pay for those projects. So, um, Julie, if you're ready, can you walk us through the webinar housekeeping, please? Um, yeah, so I'll um, quickly go over um, our tonight's agenda. So um, we'll have our main presentations first, and then there will be time for Q&A at the end. Um, please use the Q&A box for your questions. You can upvote on questions from other attendees. Um, and now for a few housekeeping tips. Uh, all attendees' mics and cameras will remain off for the entire session. If you have general comments or would like to interact with other attendees, please use the chat box. Um, the live transcript is available and you can enable that by clicking on the CC icon. And um, the recording of this session, plus the presentation slides and other materials will be sent out via email and will also be made available on our website. And um, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Kellen. Thanks, Julie. And we're recording, right? I forgot to do that. Uh, yes, it's recording. Okay. Awesome. All right. So just a little bit about the sustainability team. We are housed in the Community Development Agency with the County Marin, and we're under planning. Um, these are links to our website and event page. Uh, we put these on um, throughout the year, and we also are doing events out in the community. So please be sure to check out our event page um, for stuff that's going on. Uh, we also have a quarterly newsletter, so you can sign up on our website. And uh, we're also pretty active on uh, social media. Um, so this is the first in our series that I mentioned earlier. Um, so next week we're doing uh, more webinars on solar and battery storage. Uh, Russ is going to be back for the heat pump space heaters webinar. And then the following week, we're going to wrap it up with uh, home electrification planning and electric vehicles. And uh, if you haven't signed up for those, um, you can do it on our calendar on the website down here. So I'm just going to do a, just a brief home energy 101. You know, we're talking about electrification and, and home energy efficiency projects. And this is just messaging that we really like to get out and get into people's brains when they're thinking about their home and, uh, you know, when they're starting to make projects. So we really recommend that folks do the low hanging fruit first. Uh, one reason is because it's cheaper. This is stuff like uh, LED light bulbs, power strips, faucet aerators. I'll get into programs that can uh, provide those to you guys for no cost as well. And then um, after you, know, you take care of that, switch out all your light bulbs. Uh, the next kind of most cost effective thing you can do is building shell upgrades. So if you haven't looked in your attic or crawl space lately, um, you know, making sure that the installation levels are, are up to code and, and up to a good level so that you're comfortable in the winters and summers and you're not having to use your you know, furnace or you know, maybe AC as much. So you can save a lot that way and also improve your air quality, you know, especially when it's smoky out, when we have fires going on. Um, so really it's just a good like year round investment um, and it, it, it does a lot for energy efficiency for your home as well. So really encourage folks to look into their uh, insulation and air sealing of their homes. And then uh, you know, once you have that tackled, you can look into bigger stuff. Uh, we're gonna be talking about heat pump water heaters today but um, you know, your HVAC, uh, your windows, solar, battery backup, electric vehicles, all that stuff. Um, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense to kind of you know, do the low hanging fruit first, just from a cost uh, perspective. And uh, so these are some of those energy efficiency programs to help you get started. Uh, the Rising Sun Center for Opportunity has a green house call program that is available to every Marin resident whether you rent or own, if you're an apartment or a single family home, 
And the kits include LED light bulbs, smart power strips, faucet aerators. Uh, they have like um, gaskets for your, um, your plugs and stuff like that. And it's a free program or it's no cost, uh, we're supposed to say, because uh, basically it was paid for by your you know, utility bills already. So this is a way to kind of take advantage of uh, a program you've already been paying into. And um, I believe they're wrapping up their 2023 campaign, but you can always get on the wait list for next year. And I'm going to be putting these links in the, the chat as well. So, um, you know, don't worry about writing them down. And then uh, another program that we like to talk about for folks, especially if they're just getting started, like let's say you just moved into your home or you really want to start making energy efficiency improvements and investments and you don't know where to start, uh, Home Energy Score is a great program for that. It works by having a home score assessor come out to your house. They take all the specs and then they put all that information into a software that was developed by the uh, Department of Energy. And it basically tells you on a one to 10 scale how efficient your house is compared to similar sized homes. And then uh, it also comes with a custom recommendation list of you know, where you should prioritize your upgrades first. So again, it's just a good place to start. It's a pretty affordable uh, thing to do as well. There's a $200 rebate uh, that Bay Rent provides in Marin. So that that's uh, something that folks can take advantage of. And uh, Bay Rent also has an energy efficiency rebate program. Uh, I highlighted these two here because uh, these are also technically electrification uh, projects, which we'll get into. But I just wanted to point out that uh, the Bay Rent Home Plus program also gives rebates for insulation, duct replacement, and also induction cooking if you're looking to, to replace your old gas stove with an induction range. Um, Bay Rent can help out as well. And here's the website. And so now we're, you know, the meat of today, we're going to be talking about heat pump water heaters. And uh, the, uh, the funding program uh, landscape is gotten pretty uh, robust and complicated, um, you know, to put it bluntly. Uh, but that's kind of a good thing because there's a lot of money coming down. So the first one I want to talk about is Tech Clean California. That's for everybody in California. The baseline incentive for a heat pump water heater project is $3,100, which is pretty big. And once we start talking about cost information, you can kind of see how that, you know, plays into how much you're, you know, going to end up paying at the end of the day. And then there are kickers for um, for all these things like low greenhouse gas um, output, uh, bigger bigger um, uh, water heater sizes, and then they even give rebates for service panel upgrades when those are needed to accommodate a heat pump water heater. Mm -hmm. So a lot of good stuff there. Uh, Bay Rent Home Plus also has an incentive, four hundred dollars for when you're switching out a gas unit, putting in a heat pump water heater and 250 for electric resistance. Um, and uh, the county's program, Electrify Marin, also has a rebate. And uh, all these can be stacked, by the way, which is great. So when you're doing the math at home, um, you know, you can kind of add up all these different programs and, uh, you know, see how they work together. One thing that I'll mention is the first two, Tech Clean California and Bay Rent Home Plus, require that the contractor you use participate in those programs. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and for the Electrify Marin program, which the county runs, uh, basically any contractor um, can do the work. You just need a permit. You need a permit for all, all rebate programs, just putting that out there. Um, but you just need a permit. Uh, you need to get the right equipment and uh, just send us your application and um, all the uh, required documents that we need. And so there's more incentives. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, that passed a couple of years ago at this point, um, uh, the tax incentives became live at the start of this year. And so that uh, basically frees up uh, $2,000 for heat pump projects um, when you do your taxes. Um, we always tell folks to consult your you know, accountant or tax professional uh, just to make sure that you have a tax liability that you can put that towards. Uh, one thing that I'll mention about the heat pump incentives for the Inflation Reduction Act tax incentives is that um, the way they structured it, you can only do two th up to 2000 a year for heat pump water heaters and heat pump space heaters. So if you want to take you know, as much advantage of that as possible, it makes sense to split, split those two projects up um, 
year by year, if that makes sense. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, this, you know, there's a lot of different programs. They have a lot of different rules and, and hoops to jump through. Um, and really, uh, there's a couple um, companies and groups that have come in the market to address that issue. Uh, one is Home Intel. Um, they can help you make a plan for, you know, doing upgrades on your house and electrification projects. Quick Carbon is a great service that just got started. And uh, to find all these incentives uh, based on where you live and the contractors that uh, participate in these programs, the Switch is On is a great website to find that. Um, and I missed this part. You can always call us at the county. We work, you know, we're with the county. We work for you guys. So we help uh, folks with these projects all the time. Feel free to call our offices and we can help you out. And um, so I, I just wanted to share this and Russ might get a little, Russ, I don't know if you're going to talk about pricing that much at all. You're just the technology and stuff. But um, so I just wanted to share this just to give folks an idea of, you know, the cost of these things. Um, we took a look at 90 projects from the Electrify Marin program. So these are 90 heat pump water heater projects in Marin County that have just gotten a rebate from Electrify Marin. So not any of the other rebates. Um, and this is what we found, you know. The average is around, you know, $5,800. Um, but the range is really, the ranges can really vary. And that's kind of what we just want to get across is it really depends. Um, and Russ will get into, you know, why a project might be more expensive, like if it needs to be ducted to the outside. Um, but what we've seen is, because uh, I can anticipate some of these questions, like, you know, what happened with the really cheap ones? Basically, with the ones that are really expensive is um, folks were kind of a little handy owner builders. Those were the lower range ones. Um, so, you know, that, that also comes with, you know, its own complications and, and stresses. So, um, you know, <laughs> if you want to take that on and you have the skill set, uh, we say go for it. But, um, you know, most folks will be in that more average to medium range um, when you're talking about uh, the price at the end of the day. And again, bottom line, it pays to shop around, get multiple bids. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are installing these these days. It's a growing technology and a lot of folks are doing it. So um, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Russ uh, for our main presentation. Share my screen. You see it? Yep, looks good. Awesome. <clears throat> awesome. Thanks, Kellen. Thanks, Julie. Um, so nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me to come speak tonight. Um, this is a presentation that was actually originally hosted by Sonoma County and their Energy and Sustainability Program. Um, our agenda for today, uh, we'll talk about, we'll do a little bit of an introduction and talk about the um, the technology and, and why we're here to talk about it. Uh, and then we'll have, and I'll try not to put you to sleep, but we'll have some super basic thermodynamics and we'll talk about the refrigeration cycle because that's very important to understanding uh, and appreciating heat pumps is understanding how they work, okay? So it's, it'll be really basic, I promise. Uh, and then we'll talk about the advantages of heat pump water heating. We'll talk about how to identify heat pump water heaters and how they're different from other types of water heaters. And then we'll talk about the special considerations needed if you want to install a heat pump water heater. And then at the very end, we'll have an open Q&A session. So my name is Russ King. I'm a longtime uh, Bayron instructor. I teach a lot of classes uh, for Bayron's, our codes and standards program mostly, where we train building departments. We have a heat pump water heater class for building departments because uh, there's so many of them being installed and it's a, it's a new technology and there's some interesting special things that come into play. And um, so we train building departments how to deal with those on a code level. Um, I'm a licensed mechanical engineer in three states. My area of expertise is residential HVAC design. Uh, my company is Coded Energy. We're developers of Quick Model 3D. It's an HVAC design software. And I've been doing this for going on 35 years now. My first job out of college in 1988 was doing energy code compliance work and, and designing HVAC systems. Um, there's my email. If you have any questions, feel free to get a hold of me. I have an HVAC blog that you can see there. Um, our website is quickmodel.com. We have a YouTube channel, and I'm the author of a book. So 
Uh, I've been doing this for quite a while. So it's it's fun stuff. Heat pumps are really, really interesting to me. And I'm, I'm honestly a big fan. So let's talk about them. So to really appreciate heat pumps, you must first understand a little bit about how and why we heat water, okay? What, what is all this about? I mean, what's, why is it so important? Well, the primary reason for heating water is what we call domestic hot water. And that's the usual bathing, hand washing, dish washing, and things like that. It does not include space heating. If your space heating runs off of your water heater, uh, we call that combined hydronic. And that's a little bit different. It has a whole different sort of flavor to it. Um, but what we're primarily talking about today is, is domestic hot water, just the usual stuff that we use hot water for. Um, because excessive use of energy has a lot of negative impacts, um, economic impacts, environmental impacts, health and safety impacts. We want to do it as, as efficiently as possible. We want, to, we want to heat our water. We want to have our hot water and enjoy our hot water, but by putting as little energy into that as we can, okay? And so there's basically two main types of water heaters, okay? Um, they are called instantaneous water heaters and storage water heaters. Those are two real styles of water heaters, if you will. All right, so instantaneous water heaters, um, basically, the water comes in cold and it comes out hot right off the bat. There's no there's no storage tank or anything like that. Um, these are also called on-demand water heaters and also called tankless water heaters. The advantages are that you don't have to keep this huge tank of hot water sitting around all day, even when you're not using it. So it, the water the water flows through it, and as the water flows through it, it comes out hot. All right, there's no what we call standby losses. So when you, if you have a storage type water heater and you're keeping that tank of water at 120 degrees or more, um, it's that hot all day long and it's losing heat and it has to continuously come on during the day to replace that heat. Those are called standby losses and, and storage, I'm sorry, tankless water heaters don't have those kinds of losses. They're, they're perfect for vacation homes where you're not there all the time and they're great for, um, uses where, that you don't use all the time, like a, like a guest room or something like that. Uh, the disadvantages is that it takes a lot of energy to heat water as it's going by, okay? When it comes in cold, to raise that water uh, that many degrees takes a lot of energy very quickly, okay? So they require a much larger gas pipe than a storage water heater, or if they're electric, they require a much larger wire to, to produce to produce that much hot water, okay? Um, and the other thing with them is they can only heat water so fast. There's only, there's a maximum flow rate. So you can't have multiple showers going at the same time um, and things like that. So, so you just have to limit uh, how many showers you take simultaneously. But if you're only gonna take them one at a time, you could literally take hot water uh, uh, showers, you know, endlessly. It'll, it'll last forever and ever, but you just can't do a bunch of them at the same time, okay? The other type of water heating is called storage water heating. And that's where you basically, you keep a large amount of water hot 24 seven, okay? And by large amount of water, I mean 40 to 80 gallons is pretty typical in a house, okay? And so you have to keep it hot. So there's a little thermostat on there. When the water cools off, it the, the water heater comes on and raises it back up. So that, that water heater is cycling on and off all day long. The advantages are you can have, you can take a lot of showers at once, okay? Um, and you can also take advantage of more efficient types of heating sources, such as solar and heat pumps that we're gonna talk about, okay? Because the water is, is heated more slowly and held hot when it's for when it's ready to go, um, you, can, you can heat it more slowly. So you can take advantage of things like solar and, and heat pump and things like that. Um, they can also be used as basically a big battery, okay? If you have a grid tide, a grid intertide um, water heater, electric water heater, uh, the utility can 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 send electricity to it and heat the water up warmer than normal uh, when when electricity is really cheap. And so it's a it's like an energy storage strategy as well. Uh, some of the disadvantages are. They they eventually run out of hot water. Okay, if you you know you take five showers at once, uh, but but it's going to run out pretty quickly, and then it takes a long time for that water heater to recover. Okay, and then of course standby losses. I mentioned that, um, and then um, 
the the thing about standby losses though is they can be they can be improved they can be reduced by by um wrapping the tank and putting insulation but you do want to be careful make sure you follow the manufacturer's instructions when you do that but you'll see a lot of water heaters uh, will have will have a lot of um, insulation inside the tank already built in and that's to reduce obviously the uh the standby losses so um some people have recirculating in homes and i just want to address those very quickly so imagine you know you go up to your sink and you want to wash your hands you turn the water on and cold water comes out for a long time all right and you're like why am i standing here waiting for this cold water finally it starts to warm up and you can wash your hands well you've just wasted a whole bunch of water okay it's just gone down the drain plus you've wasted hot water when you turn that water off you fill that pipe with hot water and that's just wasted hot water. It's going to get cold. The water's going to uh, get cold. Heat and it's soaked through the pipes, and and it's wasted. Okay, um, but it's you know it's 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 a nice feature. Some people don't like to wait for hot water, so they'll have what's called a recirculating system, and it's basically a a loop of water that goes from your water heater through the house by all the fixtures and back to the water heater and it's got a pump on it and it pumps hot water through that pipe and so the the various fixtures your sinks and showers are tapped into that loop so the only time you have to wait for the hot water to get there is the distance between the loop and the fixture which is much shorter than the distance from the from the fixture all the way back to the water heater OK, they do save water. If you're if you're concerned about saving water, and not wasting water, they do save water because you're not waiting and letting all that water go down the drain. But they waste a ton of energy. OK, they're very, very wasteful. Um, now, there's different kinds of recirculating systems. The old ones, um, the, the pump just ran 24 seven. You were just piping, pumping hot water through a loop and basically heating all the spider webs in your house. With this hot water pipe that's 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 circulating through the roof, uh, through the house. So you're you're paying for a pump, plus the water coming out of the water heater going through the loop. By the time it comes back, it's colder than when it left. So you're that all that heat is being lost, and your water heaters continually have to replace that. Okay. So one improvement on that is to put a timer. On. So so you only have the the water through the pipe during the time of day that you're most likely to use it. So maybe in the morning for a few hours and maybe in the evening for a few hours. That helps a lot. But it's still piping hot water through there when you're not using it. It's still very wasteful, plus you're paying for the pump. Um, the next best type of recirculating system that they've improved on is called on-demand. And so basically you push a button, it runs the pump, and then when the water gets there, uh, it the pump shuts off and you turn it on and now you've got hot water. Those work much better. Those can save those can save um, water and they can also save uh, energy compared to other types of recirculating systems. Okay, it's always if you have a recirculating system or you're even thinking about a recirculating system, it's very very important to to insulate the pipes of the loop. Okay. Um, I've seen systems in older houses that were not insulated and they ran 24 seven and I can't imagine how much energy they were wasting. It's, it's a tremendous amount of energy being wasted. So, so think twice about recirculating systems. I understand why people put them in and, I, and, I'm, and I'm perfectly okay with that. There's nothing wrong with it, but make sure that it's the on-demand type, okay? Because those are um, much more energy efficient. Okay, so comparing the the three main types of water heating fuel types okay so gas is probably the most common electric resistance is quite common in a lot of places and then the new the new kid on the block is electric heat pumps so you've got gas electric resistance and electric heat pumps and we'll talk about why electric heat pump is so special in a little while but let's compare the three head to head so on installation costs um Replacing a gas water heater is, is very cheap if you have a gas water heater in your house. If you don't have a gas water heater and you want to put in a gas water heater, it's very expensive because you have to run gas pipes. Um, electric resistance, if you're replacing an electric resistance water heater, it's very cheap. They're probably the cheapest water heaters you can buy if you go, go online and shop for a water heater. Electric resistance is probably the cheapest you can buy. Electric heat pumps can be expensive, okay? The unit itself is expensive. Um, if you're replacing an electric resistance water heater and you already have the electric circuit there, it's not too bad to put it in. But if you're replacing a gas water heater, 
with an electric heat pump water heater, it can be quite expensive, especially if you have to upgrade your panel. Okay, and we'll talk about some of those. But the question is, the big question is, is it worth it in the long run? Okay, and that's what we'll talk about. Operation cost, you know, how much does it cost per month to use the water heater? Gas is quite low, okay, gas is cheap. On a BTU per BTU basis, gas is quite cheap. Electric resistance, uh, it's pretty high, it's pretty expensive. If you've ever lived in a house with an electric resistance water heater, your electric bills are quite high, okay? Um, electric heat pump, it's very low, especially if you have solar on your house. If you're producing your own electricity with solar, electric, electric water heating, e electric resistance or heat pump is kind of a no brainer, but especially heat pump because it's so efficient. Uh, as far as safety goes, gas is terrible. Gas is bad. Uh, electric resistance is okay. It's not too bad. Uh, electric heat pumps are good. They're quite safe, okay? Uh, on the environment, gas is bad. It gives off greenhouse gases. Um, there's you know potential for uh, carbon monoxide and in, indoor air quality issues and things like that. Uh, for electric resistance, it's not too bad, but they use a lot of electricity. On electric heat pump, it's good. They're very, very efficient. They use very small amounts of electricity to, to do the same amount of work that, that the gas and electric resistance water heaters do. Uh, as far as performance goes, um, gases are the best, okay? Gas burns very hot and very quickly and you can heat water up fast, okay? But the question is, do you need that? Is that, is that what you need? If you live in a house with lots and lots of teenagers, then you know you may want several water heaters because you're constantly going through hot water. But if you're just a normal person and you use water heater like normal people do, and you take showers and wash your hands and do dishes and stuff like that, um, a a regular storage water heater of a normal volume will, will be perfectly adequate for you. And as long as you have hot access to a tank of water that's hot you can accomplish most of the things you need to do and never even notice the difference, okay? But if you if you have a bunch of family come over and you take lots of showers and all of a sudden you run out of hot water and you need to, you need to heat it all back up so we can all go out to dinner, um, that's a different issue, okay? Um, but um, uh, electric resistance can recover quite fast and most heat pump water heaters have electric resistance backups for those emergency situations, okay? So they're not, completely out of the out of the out of the game okay they they will they can behave just like an electric resistance water heater if you need them to okay all right so let's talk about some super basic thermodynamics and then we'll go into the refrigeration cycle a little bit so when we talk about heat we have to talk about BTUs that's a unit of heat it's how we measure heat and then we measure heat transfer in BTUs per hour. How many BTUs per hour does the water heater heat up the water? How many BTUs per hour are lost from the water heater during uh, during standby losses and things like that? All right, so BTU is a unit of ener energy, uh, of heat energy, and it's equal to about the same amount of heat that's stored in a wooden match, okay? If you take a match and you light it and you let it burn all the way down, you've just released one BTU of energy into the air, all right? so. When we talk about 50,000 BTU water heaters, that means it can put 50,000 kitchen matches worth of heat into the water in an hour, all right? So that's what BTUs means. So this little flying kitchen match in our diagrams is gonna represent a BTU. So temperature, when you measure temperature, it's the density of BTUs in something. So in your house, the air in your house has a certain number of BTUs, and temperature is a measure of the density of those BTUs. So the more BTUs you have in your house, the warmer the air is. Same thing with water. The more BTUs you have in the water, the warmer it is, okay? And as you lose BTUs, the temperature goes down. So the important thing to understand is everything has some BTUs in it. Even a block of ice has some BTUs in it. It has some heat in it. The only place you can go where there's no BTUs is the middle of outer space, okay, where it's a dead vacuum. Um, warm air, even cold air has a pretty substantial amount of BTUs in it. It's can we get those BTUs, okay? They're there, we just need to be able to get to them. Everything has some BTUs in it. So when we heat something, we're putting BTUs into that thing, 
Okay. If we heat water, we're putting BTUs in it. If we heat a house, we're putting BTUs in it. Okay. When you add BTUs to something, the temperature goes up. Okay. Very simple. So this is the second law of thermodynamics, guaranteed to put you to sleep if you're not paying attention. <laughs> um, the second law of thermodynamics is basically heat will move from warmer objects to colder objects. Heat is, think of BTUs as being antisocial. They don't like being around other BTUs. So they're always going to want to go to where there's less of them. So imagine two blocks of metal. One is warm. It's got a lot of BTUs in it. And one is cooler. It's got less BTUs in it. You put those two blocks of metal in contact with each other, and the BTUs will go from the warmer block to the colder block. They're antisocial. They want to go to where there's less of them. And they'll keep moving. They'll keep moving. All of a sudden, they realize, hey, wait a second. There's the same number of BTUs here than there was back where we just came from. And then heat transfer stops because they've reached equilibrium. They're at the same temperature. Okay? So keep that in mind. Heat will naturally go from warmer to colder. That includes air, that includes water, that includes a lot of things, okay? If you decrease the volume of something that has a certain number of BTUs in it, you've changed the density of the BTUs, therefore you will change the temperature, okay? So if you have a, a cylinder that you can compress and decompress air, as you compress the air, the temperature goes up because the density of the BTUs goes up. As you decrease the volume, or sorry, as you as you decrease the pressure, you increase the volume, the temperature goes down. Okay. I don't know if you've ever noticed or ever seen people filling scuba tanks. They're pumping a bunch of air into a tank, and that air has BTUs. And they're increasing the density of BTUs inside that tank along with the air, and it gets hot. So they have to put it in a tank of water to, to let those BTUs come off, okay? Also, um, some other interesting things, if you've ever seen a little green propane canister on your, on your Coleman stove, or your Coleman lantern or whatever, as it starts using up uh, gas and the, the level gets lower and lower, frost starts to build up on the side. That's a little bit different. That's a change of phase, okay? That's something changing from a liquid to a gas. We'll talk about that in just a second. But you can actually increase the temperature of something by decreasing its volume and making the density of BTUs higher. Um, if you have a volume of compressible fluid, okay, and you reduce its temperature by expanding that volume, if the temperature is now less than the temperature outside that tank, that that heat will go from the warmer air to the colder tank and will come into the tank. So you've basically created a BTU sponge, okay? You increase the volume and you've made the temperature colder and you put that colder temperature where it's warm, it will absorb those BTUs, okay? Very interesting. Similarly, if you compress that volume and you make the temperature hotter than the air around it, the BTUs will leave. So now you've squeezed the sponge out. So you can use a tank of fluid of a compressible gas like a heat sponge. You expand it and it'll absorb heat. You compress it and it will expel heat, okay? Very, very interesting. The ability to mechanically change the temperature of a fluid by changing its volume is extremely important. It's the basis of the refrigeration cycle. Okay, so you expand it to absorb heat, you compress it to expel heat, all right? So let's say we have a house at 70 degrees and it's 90 degrees outside. Well, the B there's more BTUs outside, they're more dense, and the second law of thermodynamics is gonna tell them to be antisocial and go inside the house where there's less of them. So heat starts coming into the house, but we wanna keep the house at a certain temperature, okay? So we take this canister, we go inside the house, we expand the canister to make it 40 degrees inside the canister, and it's going to absorb heat from the house because it's 70 degrees inside. We make it 40 inside the canister, it will absorb BTUs. Then we go outside and we squeeze them out, okay? Just like emptying water out of a bucket, you let the sponge expand, you take it outside, you squeeze it. You go back inside, you let it expand, you go outside and squeeze it. And so we're moving BTUs from the inside of the house to the outside of the house. If we can do that fast enough, we can remove BTUs at the same rate that they're coming in from the outside and we can keep it at 70 degrees, okay? 
that's how an air conditioner works. That's exactly what an air conditioner does. So we have just mechanically moved BTUs in the opposite direction that physics wants them to go. Physics wants them to go inside the house where there's less of them. And we've created a space inside the house that's even colder to absorb those BTUs. And then we take that outside and make it hotter than the outside to expel the BTUs. So we're we're pumping water uphill, so to speak. We're pumping um, uh, we're pumping heat in the opposite direction that it wants to go by expanding and compressing this gas. Okay. Well, spoiler alert: we can do the same thing in the opposite direction. If it's cold inside and the B2s are escaping, we can go outside, even if it's cold outside, and we expand the gas and make it absorb B2s from the outside cold air. We take it inside the house and we compress it to where it's hotter than the inside air, BTUs will come out. So we can do our sponge in the opposite direction. We can absorb heat outside, even though it's cold, because if we expand that gas and it gets below the outside temperature, which it does, it will absorb heat. So we expand it, absorb heat outside, take it inside, squeeze it, put the heat inside the house. And if we can do that fast enough, we can replace the BTUs that are escaping from the house on a cold day. We can do the same thing with water. We've got lots of BTUs in the air, let's say in our garage, we can absorb those BTUs from the air, absorb them, go inside, squeeze them out inside the water. Even though the water's hot, we can, by compressing it, we make it hotter than the water and the BTUs wants to come out, all right? But instead of using a, a cylinder like this, some very smart person, I believe his name was Mr. Carrier, um, instead of doing a, a, a cylinder like this that, that compresses and expands, um, they use a, a refrigerant line. It's a, it's a continuous loop. And at one point in that loop, the refrigerant is expanding. And at another point of that loop, it's being compressed. So it's a circle. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a conveyor belt of sponges going in a big circle. Okay? And it works very, very well. All right. So instead of using fixed vessels, as I mentioned, it's a it's a loop. OK, so at one point, heat is being absorbed by expanding the gas and making it cold. And then we compress the gas to make it hotter than the outside air. And we blow air across it and that heat comes out. So we're pumping heat out of the house. You can go the opposite direction. Even if it's cold outside, you can make that gas colder than the outside air so that it absorbs heat from very cold air. And then it goes inside and you can squeeze it to pump heat out inside the house, okay? And you can do the exact same thing with water, all right? Works very, very well. What exactly is a heat pump? A heat pump is an electric heater, but instead of creating electricity from, or sorry, instead of creating heat from electricity, which is what an electric resistance heater does, when we think of electric heating, we, we normally think of electric resistance heating. So the old spiral electric stove tops that got red hot when you turn them on, uh, your blow dryer, if you see inside, there's a, orange, there's a wire that glows orange and air blows across it. That's electric resistance. And most any plug-in space heater uh, where you, it's, you smell the dust burning off of it, that's electric resistance heating. That's turning electricity into heat by running it through a wire and that wire gets really hot. That's really efficient. That's almost 100% efficient. So how can we improve on that? Well, electric resistance heaters, they take, let's say in this little diagram here, five units of electricity worth of heat, and it converts it into five units of heat, five BTUs, okay? Almost real darn close to 100% efficient, like 99.5% efficient. We'll just call it 100% efficient. So how can we improve on that? Well, the way we improve on that is heat pumps, they cheat, okay? They, they don't create heat from electricity. They move heat from one place to another. So the heat already exists. It just gathers it up and puts it somewhere else, okay? And as it turns out, it takes a lot less electricity to do that. In fact, you can use two units of electricity to gather five units of, of heat from the air and get five units of heat inside the house. So that's a two for five. It's actually in some cases better than that. It's two for six. It can be up to 300% efficient because it takes that much less electricity to move heat that already exists than it takes to create heat. Now, electricity can be cost competitive with gas, okay? That's why heat pumps are so efficient. 
they move heat that already exists and they instead of creating it from scratch okay all right so heat pump water heaters the way they work is they they capture heat from the air so wherever you set a heat pump water heater it needs air to move through it, okay? And if you look at any heat pump water heater, it's gonna have some sort of louvers and some sort of fan inside of it, okay? And it's taking air, it's bringing it in, it's extracting the heat from that air and then blowing it out the other side. Well, when we extract heat from something, that's exactly the same as cooling. So it's just another way to say we're cooling the air. When you cool something, you're extracting the heat from it. It's just that we're, we're we're removing that heat. The goal is not to cool the air. The goal is to capture that heat and put it somewhere else, okay? So it captures that heat, that warm heat, through a little refrigeration cycle, just like we showed you. And it's it's about the size of a, of a small refrigerator, like a little dormitory refrigerator. There's a little compressor in there. There's a little fan in there. It does make a little bit of noise, okay? There is sound coming off of it. But, I mean, my gas water heater that I'm planning to get rid of any day now, uh, makes a ton of noise when it kicks on too. So I'm not sure how noise is a, that big of a deal with heat pump water heaters, but some people do complain about it. Um, all right, so the 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 key is is you need a continuous supply of reasonably warm air. It doesn't have to be hot air. It doesn't even have to be warm air. You just don't want it to be freezing cold, okay? Garages are perfect places for heat pump water heaters. Indoor closets, um, what happens is you run out of air, okay? If you have a louvered fan or something like that, but they do make um, heat pump water heaters, and we'll talk about this in a second, that are ducted. So they'll duct warm air from someplace in the house, like the garage, they'll cool it and they'll duct the cold air out of the house. Okay, those those are becoming much more common. So if you're thinking about where your water heater is located right now, if it's in the basement, if it's in the garage, if it's in you know any kind of space like that, if it's in a large room, a laundry room or something like that, that's a good place for it. But if it's in a small closet, you, there's going to be some special considerations that need to be made for that. Okay. So a lot of people ask, well, how cold can it get before the heat pump starts working? How cold can the air be before there's before it can no longer extract heat from it? Okay. Well, your freezer is a heat pump. Okay. Your freezer is a heat pump. How cold does it get inside your freezer? It gets pretty darn cold. Have you ever seen an old, you know, a chest freezer that hasn't been uh, defrosted in a long time and it's got all, you know, frost all bit up on the side? And you open it up and there's a fog of cold air and you, you pull out a half gallon of ice cream that's so hard you have to put it in the microwave before you can scoop it out. That's pretty darn cold. That's how cold it can be and a heat pump can extract that heat out of it. Okay, that's what's happening is a heat pump, the refrigeration cycle is extracting heat from that really, really, really cold ice cream and pulling it out to keep it cold. Okay, because because heat's trying to constantly get back inside that freezer and the heat pump is removing it at at least the same rate that it's coming in. Okay, so they can work very, very well. Uh, heat pump space heaters have gotten tremendously more efficient. You can I, I know people in Minnesota, I know people in Alaska that have heat pumps that work fine, okay? So the, the technology has improved quite a bit over the last few years. All right, so what are the advantages of heat pumps for water heating specifically? Um, the big one is safety. I, I'm a mechanical engineer, I've designed many, many residential HVAC systems and I've always, always had an issue piping an explosive gas into people's houses and then when you burn that gas, it gives off poisonous gas. Okay, that just doesn't fit well with me. Um, and I actually had um, a, a subdivision that I designed the HVAC system for. Um, they had the homeowners, it was a very large extended family living in a fairly small house, and they all started getting really sick. And the builder called me and said, hey, Russ, we got a big, big problem at this house. And I was just sick to my stomach. I just thought, oh no, uh, you know, there's carbon monoxide. There's a there's a crack in the heat exchanger or something. Well, as it turned out, there they had a gas clothes dryer, and they were doing lots and lots of laundry because there was like eight people living in a little three bedroom house, and they were doing constantly doing laundry, and it was a gas dryer, and the the um, the dryer vent came disconnected. So a gas dryer, the, the outlet air has carbon monoxide in it. Okay. And so that's what was making them sick. So I was, I was glad that they found it. I, and I was very glad that it wasn't, had nothing to do with the HVAC system. So, so anyways, 
heat pump water heaters are much, much safer. There's no explosion of gas. You know, you've seen all the, the photos of all the, the gas explosions and things like that. Um, there's no carbon monoxide given off. Um, and there's no fire hazards. If you've ever noticed um, water heaters in a garage in older homes, gas water heaters have to be elevated. And that's because, you know, if you set your gas tank for your for your your lawnmower or your paint or anything like that, those fumes are heavier than air. Uh, and if they get into where the flame is, the when the water heater turns on, it can, it can cause an explosion. Okay, so all of those things are safety issues that go away with any kind of electric water heaters. Um, and this is an interesting quote from a building inspector. The potential for something to go very, very wrong with a gas burning appliance is much higher than people realize. This is why CO detectors are required when you pretty much do anything in your house, including add a sink. Okay. A friend of mine got a permit to replace the toilets in his house, and he was required to put carbon monoxide detectors in his house. He's like, what does that have to do with, with replacing toilets? And the answer is, is because it's an opportunity to make you do that because everybody needs carbon monoxide detectors in their house. All right. So it is a very, very serious issue. We've, we've been very lucky up to this point. Another one is the, the cost of installation is cheaper and simpler. If you don't have to run gas pipes in your house, that's a huge cost savings. There's no flu vents, okay? Look at your water heater. There's a pipe coming off of the top and going up through the roof, making that thing safe and making that thing uh, waterproof so water doesn't leak back down it uh, is very expensive to do. That all goes away. If you look sometimes in your garage, they have vents, louvered screened vents in the side. If your water heater or your furnace is inside your garage, that's combustion air. That's air has to come in through those um, to go and allow the gas to burn, okay? All that stuff goes away with electric and heat pumps. Much lower maintenance, okay? Gas burning appliances must be checked and adjusted regularly. Um, if you haven't had your water heater checked in a long time or your furnace, you should. Um, the gas burner ports become clogged and dirty and, and work much less efficiently than they used to. Um, and there's no safety devices that need to fail. If you, ever, if you ever get a chance to take the front cover off your furnace, if you have a gas furnace, take the front cover off and look inside there. All those little switches, all those little tubes, most of the wiring, the little fan, those are all safety devices. That should be a red flag right off the bat. When everything inside the furnace, you know, 80% of what you see is, is a safety device, um, that, should, that should be a clue. And you should say, why is there so many safety devices there? Okay, so um, that all goes away. Now, there are some disadvantages that we'll talk about in a second, uh, but another advantage is that they're cleaner. There's no carbon emissions. Um, and then of course, depending on the utility, where the electricity comes from, um, it, it, it can be much cleaner, okay? If you have solar on your house, like I said, it's a no-brainer. You own your own electric company. You may as well use your own product. Why are you buying gas from somebody else when you could use your own electricity to heat your house and heat your water? So that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, but the, the grid's improving every day. Every single day, the grid gets better and better in terms of relying more on sustainable energy resources, okay? Another advantage is they're super efficient. We talked about this. They're 300% efficient in terms of how they use electricity. The, the technology has improved greatly. The controls have improved greatly. How they control the heat pump and how they track the heating of the water and they track your uses and things like that have come a long, long ways. Um, they're cost effective in most markets, okay? On a B2 per B2 basis, they do compete with gas and can be cost effective the disadvantages all right the disadvantages the equipment is more complicated all right just like cars uh they're not as easy to work on as they used to be all right but just like cars there's more mechanics being trained every day um you know um back in the day when you could you know change your own spark plugs and do all that all kind of you had a, a distributor cap and all that good stuff um you could do it yourself but cars have come a long ways but but you know um, mechanics have, have kept up with them, okay? And just like cars, uh, just like mechanics, plumbers are, are learning all the time. As they, as they install more of these, they're getting better at, at setting them, they're getting better at fixing them and all that stuff. So things are improving in that regards. Um, they do have a lot more complicated controls. 
Um, and you can set it to, you know, run partially on resistance electric or partially on heat pump and all that other kinds of stuff. So you, there is a lear learning curve to learning how to control it, but a lot of them go off your smartphone. It's a pretty cool little app on your smartphone. And I, I hear people, you know, I've never thought I'd ever hear this of people looking at their phone going, oh, look, my water heater's uh, decided to turn itself on. I wonder why it's doing that. Or I think I'll, I'm not going to be home today. I'll set my water heater down, you know, things like that. It's pretty amazing, the stuff that, can, that you can do nowadays. Um, they can be a little difficult to operate. I mentioned that they do require a little bit more attention, okay, to, to, to optimize their use. You can set them and forget them if you want to, but if you really want to optimize their use and make them as efficient as possible, you do have to kind of pay attention to the scheduling and the programming and things like that, okay? I, I know people who think it's kind of fun to do that. They, they think it's interesting. Um, some of the disadvantages, again, uh, grid reliability issue, issues that we start switching more and more to electricity, um, it puts more and more demand on the grid. The good news is that's improving every day, okay? All these efficiency programs we have, as we're adding electric water heaters, we're also reducing electricity uh, use by making homes more efficient, by insulating homes, by sealing ducts, and all that stuff. And then the grid is getting better every day, okay? But the time to do it is now. The time, don't wait until the grid is ready, okay? Um, you do it now. You know, it's not as bad as people think, and it's improving every day. You've heard the expression, the best time to plant a tree was yesterday. Uh, the best time to install a heat pump water heater is today. Okay. Uh, they may require some upgraded electrical panel. That's that potentially is a big issue. Um, if your house is is a is a mixed fuel house, you got gas heating, gas water heating, maybe gas cooking, and then the rest is electricity, your panel may not have been. Uh, size or it was size for a lower electric use and then adding something big like a like a like a water heater or an EV charger or a heat pump space heating may require upgrading the panel okay and if you're going to upgrade the panel you may as well upgrade it for everything take just say all right I'm only upgrading it for a heat pump water heater but let's make it big enough so I can go heat pump space heating let's make it big enough so I can go electric vehicle charging station and things like that too okay there are a lot of rebates specifically for that purpose to offset that cost. And there's also some pretty interesting um, uh, little controls where you can um, not have to go to quite as big of a panel by using these controls because it will it will prioritize, say, your, your dryer over your EV charger and things like that. So there are little smart panel controls um, that are um, allowed in most, jurisdi most jurisdictions, okay? So check into that as well, smart panel controls. All right, all of the disadvantages of heat pump water heaters are avoidable and are improving over time. Okay, so that's the good news. All right, let's talk about how to identify heat pump water heaters. So some common characteristics, they're usually 40 to 80 gallons. They're usually larger. If you're gonna replace a gas water heater, you usually wanna replace it with a little bit larger heat pump water heater. Uh, they typically draw about 1300 watts. When electric resistance kicks in, it draws about four to 5,000 watts. And that's a pretty substantial draw. So you wanna minimize that electric resistance use as much as possible by using the controls. All the major manufacturers of water heaters and a few specialty ones uh, make heat pump water heaters. So they're not hard to find, they're not hard to get. Uh, there's two basic styles, there's integrated and split, okay? Integrated has the tank and the heat pump is all in one unit. And then the split has a storage tank and the heat pump is actually a separate unit. Kind of looks like a, like a mini split, like a space heating heat pump. Or heat pump. Um, these are a little bit more expensive, but they're very, very flexible as to where you can put them. You can literally put this tank anywhere inside the house, okay? And then the heat pump is actually outside capturing heat from the air, okay? So they're a little bit more expensive, but they're a lot more flexible on how they get installed. Uh, some of the features of a heat pump, there's gonna be some sort of, um, heat pump unit, usually on top. Um, I like to say if the water heater looks like it was in Star Wars, it's probably a heat pump water heater. Uh, there's a lot of pretty interesting um, design features or you know aesthetic issues with heat pump water heaters that make them look all scientific and stuff like that. Um, but there's gonna be a control panel. There's gonna be some sort of louvered vents. Um, there's louvered vents where the air comes in and cool air comes out. Um, there are some that are ducted, so there'll be a place to attach a duct instead of having a louvered vent like that. There's going to be a large storage tank. There's going to be an electrical connection and no gas. No gas going to them. Um, these two things right here are, are the electric resistance elements that a lot of heat pump water heaters have. Okay, that's sort of your, your emergency backup, if you will. 
They do require um, the pressure temperature release valve, the safety release valve, just like a, any other water heater. Um, and they, they also, they have condensate lines that you have to, um, when you cool the air, moisture condenses out and that moisture drains off. And so there's a little drip, drip, drip of condensate. And so that has to be run somewhere. Okay. It's, it's fresh, clean water. So it can, you can drain it anywhere. It's not like off of your furnace, uh, where that water has to be treated specially. Um, for, um, a split heat pump water here, you can have a big tank. There's the heat pump unit is not on the tank. It's separate. Um, and then the condenser sits outside and there's going to be some sort of refrigerant lines, water lines running between those two units. Okay. So pretty obvious when it's a split system. Electric resistance, there's no heat pump. Okay. It's a large storage tank. And all you have is these electric resistance elements. So that's how you tell an electric resistance from a heat pump is the simple lack of a heat pump unit uh, and electric resistance elements on it. Gas pipes, the most obvious sign of a, of a gas water heater is the flue vents, okay? And the gas piping that comes into it, all right? Pretty obvious. There's a, a flue vent, gas connection, and then some sort of temperature knob on here. Okay, that's how you control the settings. Okay. Some special considerations for heat pump water heaters, as I mentioned, um, they, they might require an upgrade to your electrical panel. And like I said, if you do, plan for additional things as well. Don't just upgrade it enough for the heat pump water heater, upgrade it enough for all the other things that you may wanna do in the future. Most water heaters require a 240 volt, 30 amp circuit. Um, some new products require only 15 amp. And for, for small houses like ADUs, um, they do make heat pump water heaters that run on 115 volts. So they, they're basically they plug into the wall. All right, but those are for smaller units. They have a much lower output. Um, there are controls available for sharing circuits. I mentioned that they give priority to one use or the other. So you can you can have it prioritize the dryer over the water heater or the stove or the EV over the EV and things like that. So instead of um, uh, it, it it switches circuits, okay, depending on how you prioritize them. So that can that might help you not have to upgrade your panel. So look into those. Uh, ventilation. So heat pump water heaters get the heat from the air around them. So they need a constant supply of reasonably warm air. Okay. It doesn't have to be warm, just, just not super, super cold. Okay. As warm as you can get it. If you put a heat pump water heater in a really small closet, it's going to cool that air and cool that air and cool that air. And pretty soon the air in that closet is, is so cold, it, it has to work too hard. It doesn't stop working. It just loses its efficiency. Okay. Uh, you want about 750 to 1,000 cubic feet of air. That's less than a one-car garage, okay? 750 to 1,000 cubic feet of air is less than a one-car garage. So heat pump water heaters work great in a two-car garage. Um, as I mentioned, some of the heat pump water heaters are ducted. So instead of using the air that's right next to them, they bring in their air, they cool it, and they send it out somewhere else. So um, any hot spaces such as your garage is great. Um, and it's giving you free cold air. <laughs> you know, I live over towards Sacramento and um, do something with that cold air. So it can keep your garage nice and cool on a hot summer day. Uh, be creative with it. I know people that have put dampers in to, to send that air one direction in the winter and a different direction in the summer and take advantage of it. So there's things like that you can do as well. Recovery time, heat pump water heaters do take longer to recover. Okay, to come back to temperature if the water, if you drain all the hot water out, it takes longer to get back to its original set temperature. Okay, um, if you replace a gas water heater, you probably want to replace it with a larger heat pump water heater. So you replace a 30 gallon gas with a 50 gallon heat pump or a 50, 50 gallon gas with a 75 gallon heat pump. That way you have more water there for your use and you don't have to worry about it running out as, as much. Okay. Um, most heat pump water heaters do have electric resistance backup. You can turn that off, by the way. And and what one of the recommendations is, is, is try it without your electric resistance turned on. Only use that in emergency situations and see if you even need it. And a lot of people find that they never need it. They they turn it off and then they never turn it back on unless they have you know a bunch of family come over for Christmas or whatever. Okay. 
Um, computer models with connected functionality that allow mobile control and status checking. So, so a lot of them, like I said, they have Wi-Fi um, and remote um, apps for controlling them with your phone. Set all controls as to the manufacturer's instructions. Set the temperature set point if it's not already set. Uh, heat pump systems have several operating modes, things like heat pump only, hybrid, boost, standard, vacation. Okay, you got to pay attention to what those in. If you put it in in boost mode and and you don't need that, that might use a lot more electricity than you expected. So heat pump modes can be set for year round use if the conditions are right. Uh, avoid using other modes that that might use electricity needlessly. So start with the most efficient mode and see if you even notice. And if you find, oh yeah, we we kind of run out of water every now and then, run out of hot water. Let's let's go to the next next setting up. Okay. All right. So, uh, for you, um, Bayron has put together the really nice uh, resources. This one's called the Residential Heaters Guide to the Energy Code Requirements. So, if you want to replace a heat pump water heater, there's a few forms you have to fill out to make sure that you're doing it correctly, um, and make sure that, that you that you get all those other mandatory measures. By the way, if you replace a water heater of any kind, and you have accessible hot water pipes you have to insulate those as part of the work, okay? Accessible hot water pipes. If you add any water pipes, you absolutely have to insulate those, but you have, if you have any accessible water heater pipes under your house or up in your attic, part of the work requires that you insulate those pipes. It's a good idea to do. It's a good thing, it's a good idea. It's cost-effective, okay? So be sure to check that out. I'm sure um, uh, Kellen will have access to those for you. And that is it. 705, not too terrible. Um, if there's any questions, let's see, we got some questions actually. There's, was there one in the chat? Um, okay, Q&A. Yeah, we got I, one in, in the Q&A, um, which is pretty good. Russ, I'll let you read that. But um, yeah, well, first of all, thank you for your time. Um, always interesting um, learning about heat pump water heaters. And um, yeah, I really like this anonymous uh, attendee question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, if folks have been looking into these projects and you have like really specific um, details like that, this is a really good opportunity to, to ask for us. So I would encourage you to, um, to put those in. All right. So it says, I currently have a 40 gallon gas water heater. It is located in a small exterior utility closet and relies on power, a fan, venting through a duct above the door to the closet. The fan runs on 120 volt, which could easily be upgraded to 240 volt if necessary. Are there options of heat pump water heaters that could be easily swapped out to replace my gas water heater? Um, I've been looking at Ream and Rude models. It's not clear if these are appropriate for my situation. Um, so you have to do what's called an electrical load calculation. And so if you want to switch it from uh, 120 to 240, 240, you want to make sure you have the right gauge wire to do that, of course. Um, but um, is, you, is there room in your panel to do that? When you upgrade to 240, you have to have, you have, to have certain circuit breakers in your panel that are capable of doing that, and you have to have enough of them to handle all the different loads in the house. So you definitely want to do um, an electrical load calculation, and Bayron has a, has a tool for doing that, by the way. Um, that's very good. So assuming you do have room in your panel uh, and assuming you can't get the right gauge wire, it sounds like a pretty easy swap. You want to make sure you have the space. Um, and then all those all those things I talked about, um, having the right amount of volume and, and the right amount of um, air circulating around the water heater. By the way, those are not code issues. The code says you have to install it per manufacturer's instructions. The code doesn't say anything about the volume, but the manufacturer definitely does. So you have to follow the manufacturer's instructions. So when you when you shop for a water heater, make sure that it says it's okay to put it in that kind of a closet. And I think as long as you, if you put some louvered vents in there, you have high, low louvered vents and things like that, you may want to leave the little fan in there actually. Um, I'll, I don't, I really don't think you'll need to uh, if you put in enough louvered vents. So read the instructions for whatever water heater you get, and it'll tell you how much net free vent area you have to have, how many louvers you have to have. And usually it's a high low sort of thing. So you can get kind of some air circulating through there or get the ducted, get the ducted kind. And you can duct air, um, you know, from, from your garage or from somewhere else where it's warm, that, that would be an opportunity too. So it sounds like you, sounds like you might have a pretty good opportunity there. 
Uh, we got another one here from Patrick. We are not going to install our own water heater. What's more important, choosing a particular water heater model or choosing a contractor we trust and going with the model they recommend and, and use the most? Um, probably the second option, yeah. You know, um, contractors, have, it, it, ask them how many they've installed. Ask them how long they've been installing. They, they won't say very long, but ask them how many water, uh, heat pump water heaters they've installed. And then ask them how many of those heat pump water heaters have had issues. Um, there's some pretty good Facebook groups out there, like Electrify Everything and uh, Electrify My Home and things like that. There's some Facebook groups where you can go on there and, and, and monitor some of the discussions about heat pump water heaters and things like that. But you definitely want a good contractor and you definitely want them to install something they're familiar with. Okay. So yeah, that's a that's an important distinction to make. Let's see. When PG E has a public safety power shutoff and advantage of gas water heaters that you can still have hot water, how long will the tank stay hot with the heat pump? Exactly the same. Uh, more if you have a bigger tank. So let's say you have a 50 gallon gas water heater and and the power shuts off, okay? Um it will it will it will stay hot for a certain amount of time. Well, if it it, it could continue to run uh if you still have gas. So yeah, that is one issue, but a a um heat pump water heater if you replace a 50 with a 75, you've got 75 gallons of water um that will stay pretty hot for a while. You have to look at the different R values of the tanks and things like that. Um so um yeah, I'm not sure how long it'll it'll stay, but assuming that assuming that the gas stops coming and the electricity stops coming, you've got two tanks of, of water sitting there. Uh, the the heat pump water heater will will stay warm just as long, maybe even longer if it has more uh, tank insulation. But yeah, even in a power outage, the 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 gas um, could continue to run. It depends on the type. Um, if you have, um, if there are some water heaters that rely on electricity. The direct vent water heaters and the powered vent water heaters have a powered fan in it, and if that fan can't run the um the water heater will shut off as well so they'll they'll stop working in in a power outage just as as well as any other water heater all right um if i want to figure out if i should change out my electric or gas you have both that's interesting water heaters um how do i find someone to advise me about the best options for water for hot, for heat pump water heaters um kellen I, I assume you guys have a lot of good resources and and probably some some practical experience from the programs that you guys do to give them some advice. Is that true? Yeah, sorry, Russ, I was looking up stuff. What's the question again? Um, how do they find someone to advise them to get some advice? Uh, I mentioned the Facebook groups. There's a lot of Facebook groups where people talk about heat pump water heaters all the time. Um, I just saw another one. I, I, I heard some really good uh, feedback on the 110 volt heat pump water heaters for, for smaller dwellings. Um, so I'm sure you guys have you guys have do you guys have experts that you can consult with and advisors? Yeah, so for local resources, uh, there's a great group called greenchange.net, and that's the website too, greenchange.net. And they um, basically work by bringing folks together to share their project experiences. So if you want to talk to someone who's actually you know probably installed uh, multiple different types of heat pumps, that's a good place to start. Uh, Resilient Neighborhoods is also a great resource. They they kind of do the same thing, but they put on these classes and um, they go over all sorts of sustainability measures. And uh, that's a great network as well of folks that have done this stuff. Sustainable Marin is a local nonprofit. Um, so if you're just looking to talk to somebody who's actually done it, um, those are some good resources. Uh, Bayren does have the Home Energy Advisors. Um, but we actually just recommend folks call our office, um, myself and my colleague, Mark Chabria, who runs the Electrify Marin rebate program. We talk to homeowners all the time um, just about what they're looking to do, you know, what programs they want more information on. So I'd, I'd, uh, I'd recommend that for, for like more of an expert um, walkthrough type of thing. And Russ, we awesome. got a couple uh, questions that leaked into the chat. This one's interesting. Um, cause I, I've heard some, um, some comments on this, uh, just about the noise issues with, um, with heat pump water heaters. And this question from Guy says, uh, does the, uh, split heat pump address the noise issue? 
So the split heat pump, your your heat pump is outside. So it's going to be like an air conditioner outside. It, the the little heat pump looks just like if you've ever seen the little heat pump condensers for for ductless mini splits. It looks and it behaves just like that. So it does have a good size fan on it. So that fan does give some noise, but it's outside your house. It's on your side yard or in your backyard or something like that. So it can certainly address that. Um, it's it's interesting to me that I I hear this complaint. I've not. I've never heard a heat pump water heater that was any louder than a refrigerator, uh, like a little dormitory refrigerator. You know, it it, it might when it comes on and it buzzes and a little fan comes on. Um, our gas water heater is in a closet. Uh, and when we're watching TV, we can hear our gas water heater come on and it it's and you hear the flame and you hear, you know, all the water starts popping and everything. Uh, it, and I can't imagine a heat pump water heater would be any noisier than that. Um, but, um, try and check them out again. Uh, like we just said, the best, the best resource is to talk to someone who's done it and, you know, ask around, do you have any friends who've done it? Ask, come over and ask to, if you can hear their water heater go. I can't imagine they'd be that loud. So, um, I wouldn't want it in my bedroom or, you know, in a closet adjacent to my bedroom, but if it's in the garage, I, I hardly think it would be an issue. So there you go. Uh, there's a couple in the in the Q&A, too. It says, our garage is a long way from the house. Our current gas heater is in a small outdoor closet attached to the house. Do we need to install a heat pump water heater in the house somewhere? Uh, there's not really space for that. No, it can go in it, as long as it's a, if it's a weatherproof closet, um, it can go in that just fine, just like a just like a gas water heater. Um, but you as far as ventilation of that closet goes, read read the different manufacturers instructions. And they will say that this water heater can go in a closet that's three foot by three foot by eight foot tall, as long as it has, you know, two vents that are 12 inches by 18 inches in, in the door or in the side or something like that. It'll tell you how much how much ventilation that closet needs, but it it should be fine. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's water heaters that'll work just fine in a little outdoor closet like that, as long as it's weatherproof. And I'm sure it is if you've had your your gas water heater in there. Uh, another question here, can heat pump water heaters replace a gas furnace for radiant heating? Ah, okay, that's a completely different beast. Yes, they can, um, but there's a lot more comes into play. Now you need a, a much larger uh, water heater if it's gonna be what we call combined hydronic. So combined hydronic means your water heater is providing domestic hot water as well as space heating, okay? You can do that. There, there are water heaters made specifically for that purpose or, or that work great for that purpose. Um, so, but, but the sizing becomes much more critical, okay? Because you don't want your, you don't want to run out of domestic hot water to heat your house. You don't want to run out of space heating to use domestic hot water. So it, it becomes much more of a, of a critical sizing issue. Backup Electric resistance is probably more important in that situation, but yes, absolutely, it can it can happen. It can happen. Uh, now, it won't replace a boiler as long as we're we're clear that that's not the case. A boiler, um, like a like a steam radiator in an old house, uh, it won't get water that hot, but it will do uh, forced air hydronic, where where the hot water blow goes through a little radiator and air blows through it. There's a fan that blows through it. Um, those are very common. Um, it'll do like baseboard heating. And I'm I'm pretty sure they've even used them in radiant floors as well. So so yes, um, Russ and and yeah, just to expand on that, a, a lot of Marin homes are Eichlers, so they used to have the the radiant floor systems. And what we've seen folks um, do to kind of replace that heating system is just go to mini split heat pumps, um, and then just get rid of the the water system because uh, it it can be inexpensive. I, I mean, people do like them. So if you have the means and you want to keep that, um, because the uh, the heat pump water heaters that, that do work with radiant heating tend to be a little bit or a lot more expensive. Is that correct? Yeah, they're bigger, higher capacity. Yeah, yeah, they tend to be. And you know, a house that old, um, they probably they they probably didn't design the radiant floor as efficiently as they do today. They you know the the pipes could be deeper in the slab, and maybe the slab is not insulated, so you know, it, you may want to you may want to consider um, uh, going to, to to regular forced air space heating or ductless mini splits or something like that. But if you really, 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 really love your radiant floors, and some people do, um, there's 
you can you can certainly accommodate it. It's it's going to be a bit more expensive of a water heater. You could also have a separate water heater for domestic and a separate water heater for um, for space heating as well. That's always an option as well if you have room for that. Let's see. Should we expect contractors to help us take advantage of rebate programs, or should we plan to have to apply for them these ourselves? I, I would imagine it depends on the contractor, but. Um, I think it certainly would help to do your research in advance and and be able to ask contractors um, about the rebate programs and have be armed and ready when they when they get there. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, we recommend folks you know talk to your contractor. Are you participating in any of these rebate programs? If so, which ones? And then um, yeah, just come armed with that. And I was about to put a, a typed answer into that one, which I'll still do, but. Basically, the tech um, and Bayren rebate programs require the contractors participate in those programs. Um, I won't get into all the reasons why, but it's it's free for them to do. They just have to fill out some paperwork, provide insurance, you know, information, all that stuff. Uh, the county's Electrify Marin program does not. So that's one of the only programs that does not require contractors to you know sign up and participate. Um, Ninety nine point nine percent of the time, the a uh, homeowner submits for that rebate program to the county. Yeah, I would imagine that if you happen to call a contractor to come out to your house to give you a bid and they're not participating in a program, they're certainly not going to tell you about those programs. You might miss out on those. So yeah, it's it it it's smart to be armed in advance and do your research so that when the contractor shows up, you can say, what about this program? What about this program? What about this program? So uh, what are the options for a house that has radiant heat boiler and a gas water heater? Um, the boiler probably should stay a boiler uh, unless you want to change the entire uh, space heating system to a heat pump space heating system, which you can certainly do. But there's not going to be there's not going to be a magic um, heat pump water heater that will do what a boiler does. Um, boilers boilers work at a much higher temperature. Um, that's why they call them boilers. But but the heat pump water heater could certainly replace your water heater that's serving the, your domestic hot water service. OK, um, and then you may want to consider uh, replacing the boiler with a with a, a heat pump forced air system uh, or even ductless mini splits or ducted splits or whatever. Um, yeah. So, yeah, they haven't as far as I know, they haven't come up with a heat pump water heater that can that can heat the water hot enough to replace a boiler for your old style radiant or sorry radiators steam based radiators and things like that <clears throat> um here's some questions in the chat um if we want to relocate our current 50 gallon gas water heater in an inside utility closet to a heat pump water heater in the garage what is done with the old gas lines I'm not sure I don't know this. So. <laughs> um they usually they usually cap them off and if you could get rid of all your gas appliances in your house, you can actually remove your gas heater, and then where the where the gas stub comes up through the ground, or actually where it comes into the meter in the in the street, you can you can shut it off there. And I know people who who throw little parties when they do that. They, they take out their gas meter and have a little party to get it out. But if you're just capping off um, the you want you want to cap it off as close to the meter as you can, uh, because any of those joints can potentially leak gas. Um, I I I when I was uh, a proctor for BPI and doing combustion safety proctoring. Um, I asked a friend if we could use his house to for someone to come out and, and take their test. And we went up, he just had a new furnace installed and the gas lines coming to his furnace were hand tight. The installer never tightened them down with a wrench. They were tightened purely by hand. And the way we found that is you have a little spray bottle of soapy water and you spray you spray the pipes, and if it has a leak in it, it it bubbles. It, it gives off you know bubbly foam, it suds, uh, and we discovered that in his house. So yeah, gas pipes can leak, and uh, so they'll cap it off. But you want to cap it off as close to the meter as possible, or but better yet, get rid of the meter altogether. And the lines stay. You just cap it off. Yeah, like the lines yeah. in the house. Yes. Yeah. Um. Here's one kind of about uh, operating costs. If one is paying for pg and Electric, what is the annual cost of operating heat pump water heater versus a gas one of a comparable size? Um, supposedly it's comparable. Supposedly it's comparable. That's the whole thing why why the energy code now encourages 
uh, heat pump water heaters in the energy code is that they is that they are comparable. So your 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 monthly bills should be about the same between gas and electric. It depends on your use patterns. It depends on your utility um, structure that you're on. You know your time of use rates and things like that. Uh, but on a BTU per BTU basis, they're supposed to they're supposed to be about the same in terms of cost. Yeah. Yeah, and this might get more into our uh, webinar um, next week, next Thursday on uh, heat pump space heating. Um, but yeah, similar uh, answer that the rush just gave. It's it's it can be comparable in cost, but it, and it's really important to have your your home um, building envelope air sealed so that your HVC system is performing um, the way it's supposed to. Uh, because if you put a heat pump in a leaky house, um, you know, it's going to have to work harder. And then you might see your electric bill go way up. And, you know, it's like, oh, I thought this thing was supposed to be saving me money. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's just an important thing to consider. Uh, kind of a follow up on uh, two questions ago. Um, when, uh, so. when it when the um, uh, gas lines are capped. Does PG&E have to come out and do anything around that, or is just the contractor take care of it, and that's it? If it's just the one line going to the water heater, the contractor will do that. But if you're removing your if you're removing your gas meter, I believe PG&E will come out and cap off the main line coming into the house. Yeah. Great. Um, well, we're getting some last minute ones should uh the what should the hot oh this is a good one should the heat pump water heater be drained every year as uh, current conventional water heaters yes i believe so it, it depends on your 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 the hardness of your water and things like that but they're susceptible to the same uh, scale buildup as as any other water heater great um well yeah let's uh i think we kind of answered everybody's questions. I just want to pull up our schedule here. Um, and I always forget where to go with the slideshow. <laughs> um, well, this is fine. Can folks see this? Yep. There we go. Okay. All right. Um, oh, we've got one more Q&A. Oh, this is actually a really good one, Andy. Um, is there any urgency to upgrade this year for rebates? Contractors are sending out mailings indicating to do so. Uh, do you have a ballpark price for panel upgrades? I was told to add uh, 30 amps to the line. Um, you know, it kind of depends. Um, <clears throat> rebate programs come and go. Uh, I've heard some experts say that we are in peak rebate. So we're, you know, it's only going to come down from here. Um, but it really just depends and it's a hard, it's a moving target, right? Um, the tax incentives are gonna stay for a while. So I don't think there's any worry there, um, but there is a concern of, you know, especially the tech program, which is statewide, you know, once they run out of money, that's, that's it. So there could be, um, you know, some motivation there, especially with the tech incentives, which are, you know, start at $3,100. Um, to look into that, Tech also has a rebate for panel upsizing, uh, which I believe is two thousand um, dollars. So you know, right now it, it it might be worth looking into, especially for that rebate. Uh, that being said, there are additional programs coming down the pike. Um, but from what I understand, and they're still being worked out, so we don't really know what they're going to look like or um, how much money. Is going to be available, but they're really focusing on you know lower to moderate income uh, homeowners. So it also you know just another variable to throw in there. It kind of just depends on your household income whether you'll qualify for you know different rebates amount or rebate amounts and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, Andy, sorry it's not a great answer, but um, yeah, it's just it, it is what it is. It's a moving target with these rebate programs. They come and go, um, and they're changing all the time. Um, uh, Patrick, the uh, chat said they upgraded their panel from 100 amp to 200 amp, and it was about $8,000 to do that. So that's a big upgrade, though. That's pretty substantial. Yeah. And just to give a shout out. So our next uh, webinar is going to be on solar and battery storage. Uh, folks that are looking into those projects, I encourage you to tune into that one. Um, Russ is going to be back for heat pump space heaters. And then on November 14th, we're going to be doing home electrification planning, where we're really going to dive 
into the panel upgrades when they're needed and especially how to avoid them. Because if you can avoid them and uh, do everything you need electrification wise to your house, you uh, eliminate a big cost right there and uh, potentially a lot of time by um, you know, having to contact pg and &E and all that sort of thing. And then we're wrapping up the series with electric vehicles. Um, so we're about, we're about at time, about two minutes. Uh, I want to thank everybody for spending your evening with us. Uh, I want to thank Russ for, um, for, for your presentation. It was really great. Uh, thanks, Julie, for all the help uh, behind the scenes. And uh, we'll sign off for now. Everybody have a great night, and we'll see you at the next one.